Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He has done great things, he has done great things, he has done great things, bless his holy name. Nice, very nice. Thank you, David. Well, I trust you all had uh, a wonderful Thanksgiving. We're able to eat a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think I ate too much. I had to go home and take some Alka-Seltzer, only if I had it. <laughs> but uh, we're glad that we had a wonderful time. I trust you did too. Well, we're going to be starting a new series of uh, sermons, as you see in the bulletin, also leading up to the new film that come out uh, through David Jeremiah, uh, his uh, organization of Turning Point, as well as his church, Shadow Mountain, uh, has made a film. It's a docudrama, and it's called Why the Nativity? And so we're going to be preaching about why the nativity and some characters and uh, uh, teaching around that leading up to Christmas. And of course, you know Christmas Day is uh, on Sunday this year, and we're going to have our regular service at 1045, but at that, that service, there'll be no song service, um, there, there'll just be the film. Uh, it'll run the whole time of, of our service time, and maybe just a little bit over, but you're used to that, right? <laughs> it should be a really wonderful experience. I've already viewed the film. You can watch it as well. It's out on YouTube or at his organizational um, web page. But um, if you want to wait and be surprised at what it's all about, uh, it'll be a blessed uh, first viewing. But uh, the more times you watch it, you'll pick up more things because there's a lot of uh, messages that are kind of sublime, um, subliminal, and uh, that point about why Jesus came. And so I hope you'll make your plans to prepare your heart for Christmas uh, by coming to church and, and listening for God's voice and all the word of God. So we want to acknowledge the Lord on his birthday, uh, December the 25th. Youth Haven toy drive back there. Bring your unwrapped new toy for the tote and uh, we'll make sure it gets over there. I'd like to say a special thank you to all the ones who come out yesterday. We had a wonderful time. It was a lot of fun decorating the church up. Uh, all of you know who you are. Thank you so much. And all right, let's pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this wonderful season leading up to the advent of your only begotten, our Savior. We pray that you will prepare our hearts in these weeks to follow leading up to that great day. And Lord, that we'll not forget what Christmas really means. Just bless each and one of our families and, and help us, Lord, as there are so many gatherings and special events and family times and all the rest. Lord, may we in it find rest in the wonderful, wonderful truth that God came to earth to save us in the person of Jesus, the Lamb of God. In his name we ask all these favors. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior And it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy cross. Sign. 
Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by thy power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my soul be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend to friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in the peace with thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross This one's a song request by one of our people here who bears my first name. My first name's Carl, by the way, but I go by David, so. <laughs> I love this song. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice The sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is singing. And Let's stand on the last verse and stretch your legs a little bit before the pastor comes. 
I'd stay in the garden with him. Though the night around me is falling, but he bids me go with the voice of woe. His voice to me is gone. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Please be seated as the pastor comes to bring the message. Thank you, David. If you'd like to attend Junior Church, you can head that way right now. All the rest of us, take our Bible and go over with me to Isaiah chapter 7. We want to think about this season. Every year we sing the songs about it. We adorn our homes with scenes and reminders of it. We great care put out all the trimmings. We greet one another and even strangers with glad tidings. And even a world that's ignorant of its purposes seems to celebrate in some way its remembrance Christmas. The time of year when we rejoice in the earthly coming of Jesus, the Christ. It's the season when all the world stands still for a moment in celebration of Christmas. How often really, though, do we focus our attention on this remarkable story? If we're really honest, we tend to get lost in all of the hustle and bustle and the shopping and all the, the things that come, the, all the events that we have as family and friends. And as a church, we have plenty of gatherings. But in it all, sometimes we can miss that quiet meaning of the nativity. We can spend Christmas time shopping for presents, cooking meals and gathering, and yes, football and all the rest of the festivities of the time of year. But there's so much more to this time of year, isn't there? It's the moment of fulfillment. It's the culmination of hundreds of years of prophecies from Genesis to Malachi of the Old Testament, it's filled with foreshadowings and prophecies concerning the coming of this one child who would later become our Savior, our substitute, our sacrifice. These ancient words of prophecies regarded not only his coming, but also the manner of his coming, the location of his coming, his ancestry, his life, and yes, even his death, is foretold in the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 3, verse 15. And so the story started in the Garden of Eden and has ended in an empty tomb, but this is also the story about God's people, about their need of a Savior, about our need of a sacrifice, not of bulls and goats or 
lambs of an animal kind, but the lamb, the lamb of God only, who could take away the sins of the world. And all this is orchestrated supernaturally by God himself. For only he could bring together all of these prophecies over all of these millennial millenniums. With each detail of the birth of his son in the Christmas story that's filled with also fascinating personalities and profiles. And as we think about Christmas, as we think about the story, an event so pivotal in all human history, it's the greatest story that ever was told. And how it was prophesied and of the people that would be involved in it. The first morning as we consider why the nativity? Why the nativity? We think about what Mary must have thought. And those who knew the scriptures and those who did not. Those who were just sitting on the hillsides outside Bethlehem, tending sheep. Why? Why did Jesus have to come? Why the nativity? As we approach Christmas, again, leading up to it, David Jeremiah's team has put together a great video, docudrama, and some excerpts from that I would have you to see. This first one, why did Jesus become a man? Five reasons why Jesus came to the earth. Listen to what Dr. Jeremiah has to say. Jesus not only came at the perfect time, he brought the perfect message. He brought hope and light. In a world ruled by the sword, this teacher would bring perfect peace. In a world of violence and retribution, he would teach to love one's enemies. In a world of death, he offered hope of new and eternal life. The Romans dominated through the power of terror. He would dominate through love. That was a message to capture the world in the fullness of time, just when his truth and love could spread with the greatest impact. Jesus came to bring the most radical, most wonderful message that would ever be presented. Let's read our passage in Isaiah chapter 7. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And his name shall be called, they shall call his name Emmanuel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the coming of Jesus and how it's the culmination of all of history, really, fulfilling all that you've planned when you foresaw, even before the world began, our fall and your great love that would redeem. Just help us, Lord, as we think about why Jesus came and why he had to become a man, why you, Father, would take on human flesh through him and live among us. If there's anyone watching or listening, Lord, that has never asked Jesus to be their Savior, may today they realize that you came for them. Help people to believe, to receive, to repent, and to be born of you. 
to make their heart your Bethlehem. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First of all, Jesus came and he became a man to satisfy the prophecies of the Old Testament. Do you realize that the Old Testament spoke freely about the coming of Christ? That you can find all of the doctrine of Christology uh, of Jesus the Christ right from the very beginning. I mentioned Genesis 3.15, how the Bible said that he would be bruised. His, his foot would be bruised in order to defeat this serpent who had caused us to, to stumble and to sin. Oh, that foot would one day crush the head of the serpent. Jesus became a man to satisfy the prophecies of all these Old Testament. Uh, more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ are recorded in these Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah wrote in his book of chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It was just a, a, a special birth like the birth of, uh, of, of the patriarchs in, of old. God had told Abram and Sarai that they would be having a child, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they got very old. And indeed, there was a very special miracle that night when, when uh, their child was born. And no, it would not be Ishmael. It would be Isaac. It would be a promised one that an old couple would have. A miracle, no doubt. But this miracle that that one foreshadowed was even greater in that it wasn't just an old woman and an old man of human origin and human nature and fallen nature and sinful nature. This would be a special child. This would be God with us. Emmanuel. This would be as the as the angel announced to Mary, a young teen, a young woman, uh, never knew a man, had, um, was a spouse to Joseph, as Luke 2 told us. And we know that story so well. How, of this special child would be through a virgin woman. And the Holy Spirit would come upon her and she would give birth to the Son of God, the Lamb of God. John would say, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus became a man to satisfy all of these prophecies. And so that first uh, uh, reference in Isaiah, we see an old prophet uh, hundreds of years before the night in Bethlehem, before the nativity, and... Uh, God spoke to him as well. We are now ready to explore the questions that surround our remarkable journey through the wonder of Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Just when people most needed hope, God sent prophets to offer a foretaste of a better picture. More than 300 Old Testament prophecies would be fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the first would come to pass in a little town called Bethlehem. So his name would be Wonderful, Counselor. Oh, and what stumbled, uh, stumbling stone was to the Jews, he would also be Mighty God. 
Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. You see, that's what they stumbled over, the fact that Jesus was a man, but Jesus was also God with us. He was God. I don't understand that, that trinity. It's, it's beyond our comprehension that God is three and yet one. Jesus had said that he and his father were one. And we know that that's why they wanted to crucify him. Blasphemy. Oh, they couldn't do it, but with Roman law that he was saying he was a king and not paying taxes and all. But really, the reason the Jews wanted him dead was because he said he was God. And he was. Uh, again, how that little baby's mind would, would grow into a, a little boy and then and into a, a young man and then uh, probably somewhere in, in, in the time of his preteen, 12 years old, he says he must be about the father's business. He knows who's he, who he is at that point. And he would be the one to bear our sins. Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, it said, Jesus said there, all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And you remember on the road to Emmaus, he expounded to them a lot about all of these prophecies of who the Messiah was. God, the everlasting Father, mighty God. He not only told of this special birth through a virgin, a young woman, a spouse to a man, and before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. It was such that I'm sure they had quite a, a stir in the community about her. I, I know later on they even accused him of being born uh, out of wedlock, as it were, born uh, as, a, as a, 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 a bastard child and not a, a holy child. That's what the Pharisees really said of him. You know that, right? They thought that she was an adulteress. She was pregnant before she was married. The actual ceremony. Oh, the betrothal was just as, as strong for the Hebrew uh, couple as, as, as marriage. It had to be given a bill of divorcement. But while he thought about that, Joseph thought about that, the angel spoke to him too. Aren't you glad of that? Don't be afraid to take to yourself Mary, your, your spoused wife. That Holy One is the Son of God. So he did. And they both, in, in spite of all of the, 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 the uh, controversy and, and scandal, they, they stayed together. And the Bible says that Joseph knew her not until the holy child was born. Think of what that must have been for Joseph to not touch her because she was the holy one touched of the Holy Spirit to give birth to Jesus. He didn't have a human father. He did not have a human father. And again, the chemistry of the blood, uh, they teach that the, the blood comes from the Father, through the seed of the Father, somehow. I don't understand it, but I do know that Jesus, his Father, was God. And that holy blood that ran through his veins was sinless. He became man to satisfy these prophecies. Micah, in chapter 5, verse 2, said, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, 
Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Notice, again, his divinity, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Oh, there's much to be learned uh, even in this place that was foretold 722 years before that birth ever took place of exactly where and exactly when and how he would be born. Prophetic indeed. Bethlehem, that place where the favored Rachel died on the way, giving birth and was buried at Bethlehem. Bethlehem, that place where David was from, who would be the king, not of man's choosing, but God's choosing. Oh, when man got what they wanted, they got a Saul, and it wasn't so good, was it? The first king, Saul. When, when we're king of our lives and king on the throne of our hearts, it's not so good. But when we're born of Christ and when we, we realize who he was, uh, that, that chosen one who would not just be the son of David, the king of Israel, he'd be the king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? When we realize that, Bethlehem is a very significant place. How did it happen? I tell you, in that, it's a mystery, as God foretold it, 722 years before it's happening, and she's with child, and they're living in Nazareth. They have to get to Bethlehem. How is that to be? I tell you, there was a decree. Oh, it's from, from Caesar that all the world must be taxed, and everybody had to go back to their hometown, and they, too, both were from So at that very moment, I mean, if it would have been a little earlier, she would have had the child in Nazareth breaking this passage in Micah. If it had been a little bit later, they, they would have missed the mark. You see, God's word is so accurate to the very place and time. And so they travel back just when she's ready to give birth. There's no room. They're in a stable, a manger, all foretold. God would see to it that his word was carried out to the very detail. Jesus became a man to satisfy these prophecies. And oh, we know the prophecy also of Jeremiah chapter 31 where he would say, thus says the Lord. A voice was heard in Ramah. Lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. That place is Bethlehem, where the, the wicked King Herod having seen an entourage of kings coming, magi coming, to honor him who would be the king. When, when Herod said, bring to me word when you find him, and indeed they found him, but they were warned of God as well. Don't go back to Herod. And when Herod found that out, he, he inquired as to what the time frame was, and he he, he, he realized that it was a time frame of some two years, and, and because the Magi got there later, and in the house they saw the child, and so adding up the time frame, he, he sent forth a wicked decree, the fantasize of every boy two years and old and under to be killed. Weeping in Bethlehem. Weeping because her children are no more. And that was fulfilled, Matthew 2, verse 16 through 18. 
tells exactly that Herod did those very things that were prophesied hundreds of years before by Jeremiah. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceeding angry and sent forth and put to death all the male children who are in Bethlehem and all, and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men, then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Some mathematician Uh, figured out all of these prophecies. The fact that all of these prophecies could be fulfilled over this space of time in, in this one single person would be calculated out to be one in 83 billion chances that that could happen. One in 83 billion that all of what was prophesied would happen just the way it did in this one person, Jesus. Doesn't that tell you that this is a God thing? This is a God event. It's the greatest event, the greatest story of all time in this, our Christmas story. Jesus became a man to satisfy all those prophecies. Number two, Jesus became a man to show us the Father. Philip had asked Jesus one day in John 14, verse 8 and 9, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? What Jesus, again, is telling them is that he and his Father are one. I and him and him and me. I don't understand it, but all of that brain and hands and mind and mouth and all of that body was God's body. Just like I'm a person of of a trinity with with a body, with a mind, a soul, with a spirit, and yet I'm one person. So it is with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has come to show us the Father. When you, If you want to know God, you get to know Jesus. If you want to know what God is all about, you just follow Jesus through the Scriptures, and you will, you will read and see and hear the voice of God. Again, No one can be known until they speak. And Jesus is the great Logos, as God has spoken to us in these last times by his Son. And remember, it was him that uh, in the beginning God said, and it was. It came into being through the Logos, through Jesus. All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that has been made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. And so if you want to know God, get to know Jesus. As a matter of fact, you can't know the Father without the Son. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me, through me. Jesus became a man to satisfy these Old Testament prophecies. Jesus became a man to show us God, to show us the Father. And then number three, Jesus became a man to save us from our sins. Only a man would take the place of a man. Oh, God showed us through all of those lambs of old and rams and heifers and and goats and bulls and all that that an innocent life 
Oh, a spotless lamb, not, not the worst of the flock, the best of the flock. But again, know that you're not redeemed through the, the blood of bulls and goats, but through the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Christmas is because Christ had to come to be our lamb. Only a man could take the place of a man. In the garden we fell, man sinned, and sin passed upon all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's written in the Roman letter. So only a man. But that's why it couldn't be a, a, a miraculous birth of, a, of a, an old man and an old woman. Uh, there, there were many miraculous births in the Old Testament, but none of them could match this birth. And Jesus had to come down to become our Savior, to, to be our substitute. Only God could become the God-man. 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Paul went on to say, of whom I'm chief. I'm chief of sinners. When you get to that place where you realize that Jesus came because you sinned, it becomes personal. He, be, he can become your personal Savior. He didn't just die for the world. He died for you. He died for your sins. Jesus became man to save us from our sins. Jesus became the sinless substitute for sinful man. If Christ hadn't come, all of history would have been a downward spiral to despair and death. Death eternal. But because of Christ and Christmas, there can be resurrection. Yes, we, we acknowledge that he's born to die. He, he's born to take away our sins. Oh, oh, oh and he's going to suffer as well. His mother and those watching are going to feel the pain of, of Jesus' sufferings. But this holy night, let's welcome his birth. Let's rejoice with the angels and sing on high, peace on earth, goodwill toward man. Let's be the friend of man. Because God became a man. To make us the friend of God. He came to earth. We could go to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. That's his purpose. That's why the nativity. He came in such a humble way. Unrecognized. No room for you. It's the world. It's, it's, the, it's sin. It's, it's, it's all the other things that become God, the man. When we can get all of those things beneath him, when, when he and he alone is our God, and he alone we worship, then we're understanding a little bit of why the nativity Jesus came, he became a man to satisfy the prophecies of the Old Testament, he, he became a man to show us the Father, he became a man to save us from our sins, and then number four, Jesus became a man to sympathize with our weaknesses. Just remember that when Jesus became a man, he literally became human, with all of the human emotions and human 
needs and feelings, and he hungered, he thirsted, he got tired and weary. He, he, he knows all of the emotions that you have, all of the experiences. I believe in the incarnation that Jesus literally tasted every single suffering that mankind would ever know. Say, well, he doesn't know what I'm going to. Yes, he does. And way beyond it, he cares. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Ah! was in all points, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly, confidently to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. What's your need today? What is it in your heart that's causing you such suffering and pain and, and, and a feeling that's overwhelming and, and, and that others can't seem to, to enter into? I tell you, Jesus, when he took upon himself the form of a man, human, he was touched with everything that touches you. And he cares, and he'll help you. If you can come to him, if you can give it to him, if you can recognize who he is and what he's done to, to help you, to save you, to sympathize with your weakness, you can go to Jesus with whatever is going on in your life. He understands. He cares. He became one of us. Make us one with him. He suffered for us. Dr. Maxwell Maltz, a plastic surgeon, he tells of a man who had been attempting to save his parents in a terrible fire. His elderly parents, trapped in the house, died in that fire. And him, in his trying to rescue them, was burned over a great part of his body and his face, badly disfigured. But that man, Dr. Maltz said, had mistakenly interpreted what had happened to him as some sort of a punishment from God for not having gotten his parents out safely. In anguish, he refused to let anyone see him, not even his wife. He was estranged from her in this awful time. So she went to see Dr. Maltz for help, and he said, I can fix him. But she knew her husband wouldn't, that, that he wouldn't come and that he would turn down any offer of plastic surgery. He, he was a tortured man, a soul, alone. And when she visited him again, he, he asked why she had come again. She said, Doctor, I want you to disfigure my face so that I will look like him and be like him. If I, if I could just share in his pain, then maybe, maybe he will let me back into his life. Plastic surgeon wrote, I had never heard of anything like that in my whole life. I had always been paid to help people look better, and she wanted to be made to look like her her husband disfigured. He wouldn't do it, but he decided that he was going to go to the man and try to talk him into this surgery and, and tell her, the husband as he knocked on the door, I'm a plastic surgeon and, and I want you to know that I can restore your face. No response. Please come out, he said. Again, no answer. Still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz told the man of his wife's proposal, she wants me to disfigure her face, to make her face look like yours and hope that you will let her back into her life. 
That's how much he loves you. There was a brief moment of silence. And then ever, so slowly, the door now, doorknob began to turn. The way that woman felt about her husband and the, is the way God feels about you and I. He came down and was disfigured from that holy one that he is and in becoming dust and dirt and of the earth, a man, but without sin. But he let our sin disfigure him so that he might identify with us so that he might experience what being human was, that he might make us divine. What kind of love is that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him could not perish but have everlasting life and come to a new resurrection, a resurrected body, perfect, beautiful, eternal. Finally, Jesus became a man to secure our hope of heaven. He came to earth so we could have this wonderful promise of heaven. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. He said, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, he said. Colossians 1, 27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is? Christ in you, the hope of glory. I've been listening to Christmas music the last few weeks, the last couple weeks now, as I'm running my machine at work, and, and there's so many wonderful, wonderful songs about Jesus coming, God in the flesh. And, and there's one that, 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 that talks about making my heart your Bethlehem. Be born in me, the song says. And really, Jesus was born in a manger <laughs> just to show us that if he can lay his head there among the, the cattle stall and the stench perhaps and, and all the rest with no room anywhere else, nobody's got time, they're all in a bustle and hustle, that's the way it is at Christmas, too. That if Jesus can find that sweet place in a stall, what a wonderful place in my heart to make his, his place of rest my soul. You know, the wonderful truth of, of Christianity is that not only did Jesus come into our home, the world, and be like us, become human. But he never sinned, and he rose. He died for sin and rose from the dead, and now he makes his home in our hearts. Have you asked Jesus in your heart, or do you have no room? Ask him to come in. He'll come in by his spirit, and he'll stay with you. He will love you. He'll identify with you. He'll help you. He feels what you feel. He knows what you know. When others would throw stones, he says, neither do I condemn you. He loves you. He, he came to save you. John 14, 6 again, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why the nativity? So God could become a sinless man to take our place, our punishment. Why the nativity? In the nat nativity, we see God coming as a royal visitor. And we mustn't forget who this visitor is in our world and wants to make our heart his home. 
Charlie was 10 years old. School was out for Christmas. And the family had chosen to spend the holiday in the countryside. Their country vacation home, away from the dirty streets of London. It was a marvelous British winter. And Charlie was happy to trade the blackened streets of London for the cotton white freshness of the snow-covered hills. His mom invited him to go for a drive one afternoon, and he quickly accepted. And as they snaked the car down the twisted roads, the snow began to fall and a storm had hit. The tires of the crunching snow as they went and the boy puffing his breath on the window it was a wonderful time, he thought. He was thrilled. But mother, mummy, was a bit anxious. She could tell this was more than a normal storm. Heavy snowfall came down. Visibility lessened. And as she took a curve, the car started to slide. And it didn't stop until it was in the ditch. The the storm is intensifying, and she's trying to drive out of the ditch lest they die in the storm, but she couldn't do it. And little Charlie pushed and pressed as she, as she pressed the gas, and, and, and they were just digging themselves in deeper and deeper, and they were really stuck, and they were in deep trouble. But up the road, they could see a light, and house perhaps and off they went into the snowstorm and knocked on the door and of course the woman told them of course of course you come right in please come in and warm yourselves the phone is yours she offered them tea and cookies and urged them to stay until help arrived an ordinary event don't suggest that to the woman who opened that door just another day no she had never forgotten that day, that woman who let the, 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 the mother and, and the little boy in. She retold this story a thousand times if once. And who could blame her? It's not often that royalty knocks on your door, stands at your porch. The two travelers stranded by the English winter were no less than Queen Elizabeth and heir to the throne, her little boy, 10-year-old, Charles. I don't think I'd forget that day, would you? But I want to tell you something far more wonderful than that has happened. The message of Christmas is that royalty has walked down our street, knocked on our door. Heaven's prince needs a place to come out of the cold. God has moved into the neighborhood. He's one of us. Almighty God is here. Why the nativity? So that God could become one of us to make us one with him. The Christ of Christmas is here. And until Christ comes to live within your very heart, you're not fit for heaven. There's no place for you in heaven. There's only one way to God. You've got to come to God by coming to Jesus, who is God, who became man, who died for man in his place and took his sins upon himself and disfigured himself with the stripes and the thorns and the nails. For me and for you, if Almighty God has fulfilled all that that he said that he was going to do, don't you think what he says he's coming to do is going to happen? Don't lose hope. Christmas is the hope of things yet to come. He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords, no longer a little lamb, no longer a little boy, a little child, a babe in a manger. The infant, no, he's coming the next time as the infinite almighty God.
and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Prince of Peace. This Christmas, let's marvel at the wonder God with us. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. Emmanuel. Imagine the moment when Joseph and Mary saw the Christ child for the first time. What a profound moment. The infinite has come to dwell among the finite, the perfect among the imperfect, and this world is graced by the presence of one who can never be limited by it because it is his own creation. Amen. They knew this child was like no other. Angels had announced him, and prophecies had foretold him. No other baby was conceived this way, the miracle of a virgin birth. Would you bow your heads just for a moment as David comes, plays an invitation song? As Jesus found a place to lay his head in your heart? Oh, there were some that said they wanted to follow him, and he told them, The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Is there a place in your heart where Jesus can come and be king? king of your life he first must come as your lamb your substitute the one who took your place took your sins he wants to save you say how preacher how the Lord says whoever calls on his name shall be saved just say this prayer in your heart Say, God, I repent of my sin. I, I admit I am a sinner. But thank you that the sinless Jesus, born of that virgin, grew up without sin and died for mine on the cross, and rose again. Say this to him. Say, God, Father, come into my heart by your Spirit. Forgive me of my sins and save my soul for Jesus' sake. Listen, if you prayed that and you really meant it, Jesus came into your heart by his Spirit. It may not be some huge explosive experience. When he came the first time, it was in a lowly manger. Nobody expected, nobody knew of it but God will confirm to your heart that he's made his place in your heart. He wants to get to know you and you him. Let us know that you've asked Jesus in your heart. We'll help you to get baptized, to follow him. And if you haven't done that and you are saved, you need to tell us, preacher, I need to get baptized. If you're saved and you're baptized and you don't have a church home, you don't have a place where you have your family of God around you to help you, maybe he's talking to you about being here as your church home, your family. Let us know. We'll help you to take those steps. Some of you are already taking them. You've studied the books. You're you're ready to get baptized. You're ready to become a member. Some of you are already working like crazy in the church and you haven't even joined it yet or been baptized, but that's great. I'm glad it shows me, hey, God's working in your hearts, but come and let us know, preacher, I'm ready, I'm ready. I want to get baptized. I want to, I want to be a part of this wonderful family of God. Just let me know. I'll be so excited and so will everybody else here that you're getting in the family 
all the way. You're already here. Just keep trusting the Lord. Keep serving the Lord, church. Keep loving the Lord. Why the nativity? Because God wants to come to you in a very humble way and show you how much he loves you. Thank you, God, for coming. Oh, we would be groping in the dark without God, fashioning little figurines to pray to. Oh, God, when we speak to you, we know that he who moves the worlds will move for us. The mountain in our way. There's so many wonderful things you've done for me, Lord, and my family, and I thank you. So many wonderful things I see in the people of God here. Just keep doing it, Lord. And the things you've promised that you're going to do yet in the future, prophesy just like this event. Oh God, give us assurance that our bodies will rise that our earth will be reformed by fire, a, a new heaven and a new earth with a new body, with God with us, and being our God, and we your people, with no more tears, no more death or separation. Eternity with God. That's heaven. And our loved ones that are there now, we look forward to seeing them on that great day. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for being here. May the Lord be with you this wonderful Advent season. Thank you, David.